Hello. Um, yeah, I've been gone for a while. I don't want to take another break like I did a while ago. So, um, yeah, this is probably the only way I can see how I can talk to, um, talk to her that what happened, no to my friends. So, yeah, I don't have my computer or phone anymore for a while, but I'm using the school computer right now, so guess um guess I'm just gonna have to do this for a bit. I'll try and get it back as soon as I can, but until then, this is uh, the best I got. And I wanted to do the free churro monologue from Bojack Horseman. Hmm. Yeah, I wanted to do that one because I just like how it sounds and I um couldn't really find any. I like listening to it. Yeah, so without further ado... So I stopped in the Jack and Box on the way here and the girl behind the counter said, Hiya! Are you having an awesome day? Not, how are you doing today? No, are you having an awesome day? Which re which is pretty shitty because it puts the onus on me to disagree with her. Like, if I'm not having an awesome day, then suddenly I'm the negative one. When people usually ask how I'm doing, the real answer is I'm doing shitty. But I can't say I'm doing shitty because I, I don't even have a good reason. So, I say... So, if I say, I'm doing shitty, and then they say, why, what's wrong? I have to be like, I don't know, all of it. So, instead, when people ask how I'm doing, I usually say, I'm doing just great. But when this girl in the Jack and Box um, asked me if I was having an awesome day, I thought, well, today, today I'm actually allowed to feel shitty. Um, so, I said to her, well, my mom died. And she immediately burst into tears, so now I have to comfort her, which is annoying. And meanwhile, there's a line of people forming behind me who's giving me these really judgy looks because I made the Jack in the Box girl cry. And she's bawling her eyes out and saying, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I'm like, It's fine, it's fine. Well, it's not fine, but you know, it's fine. And I'm like, I would also like to order a double jack meal and I kinda got somewhere else to be so maybe less with the crying more with the frying eh? eh? and the girl apologizes again and she, she offers me a free churro with my meal and as I'm leaving I think I just got a free churro because my mom died and no one ever tells you that no one ever tells you you get a free churro when your mom dies <clears throat> yeah, uh, anyway, that wasn't part of the, mm. <clears throat> all right, okay, here we go, here we go, let's do this, here I am, Bojack Horseman, doing a eulogy, let's go, hey, Piano Man, can I get a little organ flourish, um, organ flourish, nicely done, you know, I was getting a little worried I wouldn't have the right accompaniment today, guess good thing my mom was an organ donor, uh, what happened to the organ? I really can't make that sound. Um, okay, why, why don't we just leave the comedy to the professionals here? Yeah, show a little respect. This is a funeral, sir, for my mother. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, Beatrice Horseman, who was she? What was her deal? Well, she was a horse. Um, she was born in 1938, died 2018. One time, she went to a parade, and one time, she smoked an entire cigarette in one long inhale. I watched her do it. Truly a remarkable woman. <sighs> Lived a full life, that lady. Just all the way to then, which is, um, now, I guess. Really makes you think, huh? Life, right? Goes by, stuff happens, then you die. Well, that that was my time. You guys have been great. Tip your waitress. No, 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 no. I'm just kidding around. 
Uh, there's no waitress, but seriously, that's about all I have to say about my mother. No point in beating a dead horse, right? So... Now what? I don't know. Mom? Got any, got any ideas? Anything? Mom? No? Nothing to contribute? Knock once if you're proud of me. Can I just say how amazing it is to be in a room with my mother and I could just talk and talk without telling, without her telling me to shut up and make her a drink? Hey mom, knock once if you shut, if you think I should shut up and make you a drink. No? You sure? I mean, I don't want to embarrass you by making this eulogy into a meology. So seriously, if you want me to sit down, let someone else talk, just knock. I will not be offended, I swear. No? Your funeral. Sorry about the closed casket, by the way. She wanted an open casket, but, uh, you know, she's dead now. So who cares what she wanted? Oh, no, 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 no. That sounded bad. I'm sorry. I, I think if she could have seen what she looked like dead, maybe she'd be, she would, um, agree it was better this way. She looks sort of like this. Yeah, kind of like a pissed off toy dinosaur. The corner couldn't get her eyes closed, so now her face is forever frozen in this mask of tremendous horror and anguish. Or as my mom called it, Tuesday. Tuesday. My mom called it Tuesday. Hey mom, what do you think of that joke? You like that? Never did care for my comedy, did ya? Hmm. <clears throat> Here's a story. When I was a teenager, I performed, a com I performed a comedy routine for my high school talent show. There was this uh, cool jacket I wanted to wear because I thought it made me look like Al Albert Brooks. So I saved money for months. I saved up for this jacket. And when I finally had enough, I went to the store and it was gone. They had just sold it to someone else. So I went, hold and to I went home and told my mother. She said, let that be a lesson. A lesson that the good from that comes from wanting things. She was uh, she was really good at dispersing life lessons. I always circled back to things being my fault. But then, on the day of the talent show, my mother had a surprise for me. She had brought me the jacket. Even though she didn't know how to say it, I know this meant she loved me. Now that's a good story about my mother, right? It's uh, not true, but it's a good story, right? Stole it from an episode of Maud, when I saw when I was a kid, where she talks about her father. I remember when I saw that, I, I, I was thinking, this is the kind of story I want to tell about my parents when they die. But I don't have any stories like that. All I know about being good, I learned from TV, and in TV, flawed characters are constantly showing people they care by surprising them with these grand gestures. And... A part of me believes that that that's actually what love is, but in real life, the big gesture isn't enough. You need to be consistent and dependably good. You, you can't just screw everything up, then take a boat out to the ocean, save your best friend, or, 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 or solve a mystery and fly to Kansas. You, you need to do it every day, which is so hard. When you're a kid, you convince yourself, maybe the grand gesture... Maybe, maybe it'll just be enough, and that your parents aren't what you need them to be over and over and over and over and over again. At any moment, they might surprise you with something wonderful, and I, I, I kept waiting for that proof that even though my mother was a hard woman, deep down, deep, deep down, she loved and, she, she loved and cared about me, and I, want, I wanted me to know that I just made her life a little brighter. And even now, I find myself waiting. Hey, Mom. Mom, knock once if you love and care about me and want, want me to know if I made your life just a little bit brighter. My mother did not go gently into the night. She went clawing and thrashing and fighting, hence the face. Bah! Yeah, if you'd seen her, I swear, the only thing you'd be saying is, I am nailing that impression. I, 
I was in the hospital with her those last moments, and they were truly horrif- horrifying, full of nonsensical screams and cries, but there was this this one moment, this one instance of strange calm where she looked at, she looked in my direction, and she said, I see you. Like, the last thing she said to me, I see you. Not as a statement of judgment or disappointment, just acceptance. A simple recognition of one person in a room. Like, hello there, you are a person and I see you. Let me let me tell you the weird thing to feel at 54 years old the for the first time in your life your mother sees you it's an odd realization that that's the thing you've miss you've been missing the only thing you wanted all along to be seen and and it doesn't feel like a relief to finally be seen it's like oh it turns out you knew what i wanted and you waited to the very last minute to give it to me i was prepared for more cruelty. I was sure that I was going to get one final zinger about how I let her down and how I was too fat and stupid and tall to be an effective Lindy Hopper. However, I how I, how I was needy and a burden and an embarrassment. All of that I was ready for, but I was not ready for. I see you. Only my mother would be lousy enough to swipe me with a moment of genuine connection on her way out. But maybe I'm giving her too much credit. Maybe it wasn't about connection. Maybe it was about an I see you. Like, I see you. You might have the rest of these people fooled, but I know exactly who you are. Yeah, 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 that's why my mother's speed. Or maybe she literally just meant I see you. You're an object that has entered my field of vision. Well, she was pretty out of it at then, so it might be dumb to attribute it to anything. Back in the 90s, I was in a very famous TV show called Horsin' Around. Please hold your applause. And I remember one time, a fan asked me, Hey, uh, you know that episode where the horse has to give Ethan a pep talk after Ethan finds out his crush only asked him to the dance because her friends were having a dorky steak contest? In all the shots of the horse, you can see a paper coffee cup on the kitchen counter, but in the shots of Ethan, the coffee cup's missing. Was that because the show's making a statement about the fluctuant subjectivity of memory and how even two people can experience the same moment in entirely different ways? And I didn't have the heart to tell him, like, no, buddy, some crew guy just left their cup in the shot. So instead I was like, yeah... And maybe it's like that coffee cup. Maybe we're too dumb to try and pin significance on every little thing. Maybe when someone says, I see you, it just meant, I see you. Then again, it is possible she wasn't even looking at me. If I'm being honest, she wasn't really looking at me. She was looking just past me. There was no one else in the room, so I want to think she was talking to me. But honestly, she was so far gone at the point... Who knows what she was seeing? Who were you talking to, Mom? <sighs> Not saying, Mom. Staying, Mom. No rim shop there? Jeez, whatever I'm paying you, it's too much. Maybe she saw my dad. My dad died about ten years ago during injuries he, st- he sustained during a duel. When your father dies, you ask yourself a lot of questions. Questions like, wait, did you say he died in a duel? And who dies in a duel? The whole thing was so stupid. My dad spent his entire life writing this book, and he couldn't get any stores to carry it or papers to review it. And finally, I guess this one paper thought it was pretty hilarious because this this guy wrote a review and it tore him to shreds. So my father, ever the proud Mary, decided he would not stand for this besmirchment of his honor. He claimed the critic did not understand what it meant to be a man. So he demanded satisfaction in the form of pistols at dawn. He wrote the paper this letter, saying anyone who didn't like his book, he would challenge to a duel. Anyone in the world. He would even pay pay for airfare to San Francisco and a night in a hotel. Well, eventually this found 
its way to some kook in Montana who was as batshit as he was, and took him up on the offer. They agreed to meet at Golden Gate Park, ten paces and then shoot. But in the middle of the ten paces, Dad turned around to ask the guy if he'd actually even read the book and what he thought. But not looking where he, go he was going, he tripped over an exposed root and bashed his head on a rock. Good for him. Um, yeah, good for him. I wish I'd known to go in Jack to Jack in the Box then. Maybe I would have gotten a free churro. It would have been nice to have something to show for being the son of Butter Scotch Horseman. My darling mother gave the eulogy. In my entire life, I had never heard her say a kind word to or about my father. But at his funeral, she said, My husband is worse, and everything is worse now. My husband is dead, and everything is worse now. My husband is dead, and everything is worse now. I don't know why she said that. Maybe she felt that's the kind of thing you're supposed to say at a funeral. Maybe she hoped one day... Maybe one day someone would say that about her. My mother is dead and everything is worse now. Or maybe maybe she knew that he'd frittered away all her inheritance and replaced it with crippling debt, which is a pretty shitty thing to leave your widow with. Like bad news, you lost the you lost your husband, but also you lost the house. Maybe mom knew she would have to sell all her fancy jewelry and move into a home. Maybe that's what she meant by everything is worse now. Is that what you meant, Mom? I gotta say, I'm really carrying this double act. At least it was Penn and Teller, the quiet one does card trip. Hey, piano man, when I say something, something funny about my mom, can you give me one of those rim shots? Yeah, but not now. Like, when I say something funny, okay? Like, uh, what's the, what's the difference between my mother and a disruptive expulsion of germs? One's a coffin fit, the other fits a coffin. Yeah, that's an example of a funny thing. Thank you. Let's try that again. Hey, Mom, what's the difference between my mother and a bunch of Easter eggs? One gets carried in a basket, the other gets buried in a casket. All right. Ready for one more? This is the last one. What's the difference between my first-year lit major and my mom, Beatrice Horseman? One's decently red and the other's a huge bitch. Yeah, might have gone a little too far with that one. Might have been a little too, my mom's a huge bitch for the room. I'm sorry, mother. You're not a huge bitch. You were a huge bitch. And now you're dead. You know, the first time I ever performed in front of an audience, it was actually uh, with my mom. She used to put on these shows with her supper club in the living room. She made me used to... Um, she made me used to sing the lollipop song. Uh, yeah, these parties... Um, these parties, they were really something. There were skits and magic acts and ethnically insen insensitive vaudeville routines and there was this big finale and my, my mother, she always did this dance. She had this beautiful dress that she only brought out for these parties, and she did this incredible number. It was so sad and beautiful. My dad hated these parties. He'd lock himself in his study, bang on the walls for us to keep it down. But he would always come out to see my mom dance, and he would linger in the doorway, scotch in hand, and wave, watch in awe as a cynical, despicable woman he married took flight. And as a child who was completely terrified of both my parents, I was always aware that this moment of, of grace, it meant something. We, we understood each other in a way during that time. Me, my mom, my dad, and as screwed up as we all were, we didn't understand each other. My mother, she knew exactly what it felt like to have your entire life feel like you're drowning, with, with the exception of these moments, these very rare brief instances where you suddenly remember you can swim. <sighs> hmm. Yeah, I remember it. I remember it real good. But then again, mostly not. Mostly, mostly you're drowning. She, she 
she understood that too. And she recognized it. I understood it. And Dad, all three of us, we were drowning and we didn't know how to save each other, but there was an understanding that we were all drowning together. And that's what I liked to think she'd meant when in the hospital when she said, I see you. You know, the weird thing about both your parents being dead is that it means you're next. I mean, you know, obviously it's not like there's a wait list for dying. I, I mean, any one of us can get run over by some Snapchatting teen at any moment, but... You know, you would think that makes us more adventurous and kind and forgiving, but it makes us small and stupid and petty. I actually uh, had a near-death experience once, um, well, recently actually, not once, and a stunt went bad, and I fell off a building. I'm an actor, by the way, I do my own stunts, and I, I, I'm on this new show, Philbert. I'm Philbert, star of the show. Hasn't come out yet, but I heard it's getting Emmy buzz. Oh, speaking of buzz, I'm supposed to take uh, I'm supposed to take two of these every morning. Uh, but days are so screwed up because shooting schedule. I I don't even know what morning means anymore. There's this joke about um some guy who doesn't has been to so many funerals he doesn't even know what morning means anymore. I'll let you guys figure that one out. Anyway, anyway, you know, you know what I thought when I was falling off that building and I and I went into panic mode. The last thing my stupid brain could come up with before I died. Won't they be sorry? Cool thought, brain. No, no, that wasn't. Would you just dial it back already? I I don't know. I don't even know what they I wanted to be sorry. My mom, even before she died, could barely remember who I was, and of course my dad's dead. Last conversation I had about him was about his novel. He was so certain this book was his legacy. Maybe maybe he thought it would vindicate him for all the shitty things he's ever done in his stupid worthless life. Maybe it did. I don't know. Never read it. Because why would I give him that? I used to be on this um, TV show called Horse and Round. Seriously, hold your applause, though. Um, well, held. It was written by my friend Herb Kazaz, who is also dead now, and it starred this. Um, it starred this little girl named Sarah Lynn, and. It was about these orphans, and early on, the network had a note, maybe don't mention their orphans so much because audiences tend to find orphans sad and not relatable, but I never thought orphans were sad. I always thought they were lucky because they could imagine their parents to be anything they wanted. They had something to long for. And anyway, we did this one season finale where Olivia's birth mother came, comes to town, and she's a junkie. But she gotten herself cleaned up, and she wants to be in Olivia's life again. And of course, she she's like the perfect grown-up version of Olivia. So they grow, so they go to the mall and get their ears pierced like she always wanted. Oh, sorry. So isn't season six spoilers for um Horsing Around finale season six? Uh, if you're still working your way through it. Anyway, the horse tries to warn her. Be careful. Moms have a way of letting you down. But Olivia thinks the horse is jealous, so... When Mom says she's moving to California, Olivia decides to go with her. And the network really juiced the cliffhanger. Is Olivia gone for good? Uh, but of course, it's a TV show. She was not gone for good, because it's a TV show. Olivia's mother had, um, had a relapse and had to go back to rehab, so... Olivia had to hitchhike all the way back home, getting... Getting rides from Mr. T, Alf, and the cast to stop. Of course that's what happened, because you're... What are you going to do? Just not have Olivia on the, ho on the show? How? You can't... You can't have happy endings on sitcoms, not really. Because if everyone's happy, then the show would be over. And above all else, the show has 
to keep going. There's always more show. You can call horsing around dumb or bad or unrealistic, but there's nothing more realistic than that. You can never get a happy ending until... You can never just get a happy ending because there's always more show. Till there isn't, but... My mom would hate it if she knew how much time I spent talking about her... Talking at her funeral about my old show. Or maybe she would think it's funny that her idiot son couldn't even do this right. Who knows? She left no instructions for what she wanted me to say. All I know is she wanted an open casket and her idiot son couldn't even do that. <sighs> I'm not going to stand up here and pretend I understood how to please that woman. Even though so much of my life has been wasted in vain attempts to figure it out. But I keep going back into that moment in the ICU when she looked at me and I see you I see you jeez we were in the intensive care unit she was dying she was reading the sign my mom died and all I got was this free churro You want to know the shittiest thing about all this? It's when that stranger beca- behind the counter gave me that free churro. That small act of kindness showed more compassion than my mother gave me her entire goddamn life. And how hard is it to do something nice for a person? This woman in the jack in the box didn't even know me. I am your son. All I had was you. And I... I have this friend, and right around when I first met her, her dad died. I actually went with her to the funeral. And months later, she told me that she didn't understand why she was upset, because she never even liked her father. It made sense to me because I went through the same thing with my dad when he died. I'm going through the same thing now. Like, you know, what's it like? Like, it's... Like Becker, that show Becker, you know, with uh, Ted Danson. I watched the entire run of that show, hoping it would get better, and it never did. It had all the right pieces, but it just it couldn't put them together. And when it got canceled, I was really bummed out, not because I liked the show or anything, but because I knew it could be so much better, and now it never would. And that's what losing a parent's like. It's like Becker. Suddenly you realize you'll never have the good relationship you wanted, as long as they were alive. Even though you never admit it, the stupidest, stupidest part of you, it still holding on to that chance that it's just going to get better. But yeah, you don't realize it until that chance goes away. My mom is dead, and everything is worse now, because now I know I will never have a mother who looks at me from across the room and says, Bojack Horseman, I see you. But I guess, I guess it's good to know. It's good to know that there's no one looking out for you. No one looking out for me. That there never was, and... That there never will be. No, no. It's good. It's good. I know that I'm the only one I could depend on. And that I know. It's it's good that I know. It's good that I know. So, it's good my mother's dead. Well, no point beating a dead horse. Beatrice Horseman was born 1938, died 2018, and I have no idea what she wanted. Unless... All she wanted was to be seen. Wait a minute. Is, um... Is this funeral parlor B?